Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And a happy July 1 weekend to you all. I, ho I hope it's been a, a great weekend for you so far. Today, we're going to be having a picnic afterwards, and I hope everyone can stay for that. Even if you're here and you didn't realize there was going to be a picnic afterwards, I hope you'll stay and enjoy a hamburger or a hot dog and, uh, and the activities, which uh, I don't know what they all are, but I think it's all going to be fun. So I, I want to just mention that we are celebrating the Lord's Supper today. And uh, I, I, I mention that especially for the people online because they may want to get their elements together. But uh, so just uh, let's note that. Now, I don't know where you find yourselves this morning, but I came across a, a, a something. It's, this is how a, a, a church, I think it's called Emmanuel Church in Nashville, they start every worship service with these words, and these words are addressed to you wherever you find yourself. And I would like to ask you, please stand with me, and you will see them going by you on the screen as I read them to you this morning. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior. This church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, the ally of his enemies, the pardoner of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, the friend of sinners, welcome. And again, I don't know where you find yourself, but I'm sure one of those descriptions uh, fit you today. All of us come needing something from God. And the beauty is that God's really actually eager to meet us where we find ourselves today. And this morning, I, I want to greet you in his name. Grace to you and peace, everyone, from the God of all compassion and from his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's worship together. Who took on flesh, fullness of God in 
capital Oh, may I then in Him be found Dressed in His righteousness alone Faultless I stand before the throne Faultless I stand
Good morning, everyone. I always get very nervous in the hours before uh, a service, having, knowing that I have to come up here to do the prayer. But every morning that I sit in the congregation and worship along with the worship team, God takes those fears away from me, and I'm usually pretty calm by the time I get up here. I still have to read everything I uh, write while I'm up here, but uh, God is good. Uh, before I lead us in congregational prayer, I just have one announcement to make. Uh, Martin and Rennie Vanderwall are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary this Friday. Let's give them a hand. Now please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us all here together this morning where we can lift our praises freely to you. We thank you that you so love the world that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to save us all. We thank you for the gift of salvation. And we thank you for communion, Lord, that we can celebrate your sacrifice and remember that you loved us so much. We pray, O oh God, that your word would dwell richly in us, that it would be on our lips and come out in our lives. We give you thanks that you have made each one of us to be a part of your church. Every one of us has a purpose and a role to play in service to you. We thank you, Lord, for our country of Canada. Thank you that we live in a place where we can gather without fear of persecution or government interference, and we pray that we would never take those freedoms for granted. We pray for your guidance for our government leaders, legislators, and educators, and all who help to shape the culture and legacy of Canada. Dear Lord, we lift before you the many areas of the world that are not living in peace right now. There are many countries struggling in the midst of wars and famines, as well as countries where speaking your name can bring persecution and imprisonment. Lord, we pray for those missionaries who bravely go to these areas to bring the hope of your salvation through your word, and for those believers who bravely choose to follow you because they are confident in your truth. Heavenly Father, we pray for those in our church who are sick and shut in due to a variety of reasons. We pray especially this morning for Alcha, who fell and broke her rib this past week. We pray for speedy healing for her. We also uh, want to celebrate this morning with Gary Huving, whose 85th birthday is this Wednesday, and with Joan Reeve, who turns 93 on Saturday. We thank you for blessing Gary and Joan with long lives and pray for your continued presence with them. And Lord, we just lift up Martin and Rennie this morning to you. 50 years, what a great uh, testimony of your love and your faithfulness. And Lord, in a few minutes, I'm going to be introducing the divorce care program that we're going to be running here at Maranatha. Lord, there are many whose marriages do not last. We live in a sinful and fallen world, and we need your help, Lord, and your comfort in those times of pain and suffering. Lord, we pray for the Sunday school and nursery programs this morning. We thank you for the teachers and helpers that will bring your word to our young ones today. Lord, we pray for our youth and young adults, for all those who have graduated recently from elementary, high school, and post-secondary colleges and universities. We pray that each of our precious children would be led by you and would follow you throughout their lives. Lord, we pray for Pastor Tom as he brings the sermon to us this morning. Lord, fill his heart with your Holy Spirit, and may his words be your words. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So a couple of weeks ago, a video was shown about the marriage ministries here at Maranatha. Uh, one of the programs that is being introduced is divorce care. 
Divorce Care is a 13-week video-based support group for individuals going through a separation or a divorce. The program will run on Tuesday nights from September 12th through to December 12th from 6.30 to 8.30 here at the church. If you or someone you know is going through separation or divorce, this program can be of help. Myself and Janet, along with Liz and Adrian Isis, will be the facilitators of this group. Now please watch this short video about the program. Thank you. Divorces often leave a lot of residue and tensions in a relationship. A divorce can be a traumatic and isolating experience, but there is hope. Through a divorce, your life's been imploded. Now what? When I discovered divorce care, I discovered the value of finding a group of people who were dealing with or had dealt with similar things. Finding a place that you know that you can surround yourself with great people can help you walk through that. It, it is imperative. Divorce Care is a video-based support group that helps you heal from the pain of separation or divorce. I think it's a great resource for anyone who's gone through a separation or a divorce. Divorce Care talks about those things and you have a safe place in which to share how you're feeling. When you are in the lowest of lowests, going through Divorce Care is what showed me how to handle it. I talked with them, I interacted with them, and that helped me not feel so alone. It really helped me to stay grounded. Each Divorce Care video session, plus weekly small group discussion and encouraging workbook exercises, guide you to help, hope, and healing. As you go through these various weeks of Divorce Care, and you interact with the leaders, with the material, with the group members, little by little, you're gonna be experiencing a healing process. Divorce care is 100% effective on changing your life. Well, we have just a few uh, uh, notes before uh, we look at our passage for today. Uh, and that is, uh, if you're new here, um, we have a gift for you at the welcome desk, and we hope you'll go by and, and receive that, and also maybe fill out a card, let us know who you are. It, it was really warming today. When I came here today, one person said that they've been watching online, and they've just started coming back to church, and it's so wonderful to hear. Somebody else said that they want to take the step of becoming a member of Maranatha, we really want to be a, a church that includes, and so the first step is, um, you know, let us, uh, let us know who you are and how we can minister to you. I've mentioned the barbecue after church. Hope everyone stays for that. Also, this Thursday at 9.30 to 11.30 will be the first summer connection session of, during the month of July. You could read all about that in the bulletin. There will be a hymn sing today, this being the first Sunday of the month, so it's usually at 2 o'clock, but we have the barbecue today, so last year I think they started a little bit early because everybody was here, uh, so you might want to take that in. And then finally, our offerings today are for Maranatha Church, for our ministries, and uh, the second uh, offering that we encourage is for tuition assistance to uh, help people uh, to be able to send their kids to Christian school. And you can give in the donation box on your way out the door. You could give online. You can give using the debit machine, or you can set up automatic withdrawal, and those offerings will come out every week automatically. Now, we are in the midst of a series, uh, and we're, this is the second in the series, and the series is called The Good Life, which is literally about living the good life. Uh, a life that is good. And we're looking at one passage, and it's the passage uh, from Micah 6, 8. And it says this. It says, um, He has showed you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And we're looking at the second of those two things today. Last week we looked at act justly, and today we're looking at love mercy. Now, I want to tell you how I went about preparing this message today, or for that matter, how I go about preparing any message. And the way that goes is this. It starts months in advance. So I, 
I, I create a, a schedule that may extend six months or more that I could give to the band. And unless the Holy Spirit interrupts, then those are the, the sermons I'll preach on. And what that does is it gives me months, literally, to be thinking about a message, to have it bounce around. I may jot down some things. But then on the week that I'm going to preach, then things get kind of intense, right? So Monday, I, I say, okay, now this has to come together. And I'm hoping by the end of Monday, I have a, a, a keen sense of where it's going to go. And then I'll pull it together later in the week. But uh, I'm... I, the biggest thing that, I, that has to happen in any week, the most important thing, and the hardest thing is the heart work. In other words, I have to get my heart aligned to God's heart, and if I don't get there, I really don't have a message for you on, on, on Sunday. And so this week, every week presents a challenge. So this week, I got, I got to the end of Monday, and I realized I was acting as if this sermon was mine to write all on my own. And I said to God that evening, I said, God, I'm about to tell all of these people here about the merciful God, how you're so attentive to our life, and I've spent this day acting as if I'm all alone in this. Well, then later on in the week, I got frustrated with God. And, uh, and I, I was thinking, as I was frustrated with God and I was expressing my frustrations with God, I thought to myself, okay, God, how do I get from here with these very genuine feelings I have to the place where on Sunday I'm going to be telling everyone just how merciful and involved you are? See, this is what I mean, that every week it's a matter that the most important thing that could happen is I get my heart in a place where uh, I, I not only am living in faith, but I just sense I have God's heart. So... And I'm going to tell you how I worked through that issue, by the way, of being frustrated with God. But I'm belaboring this a little bit, and here's why. Because I believe that for this message today, that the only way you and I are going to be able to really take this message home is if we experience a heart transformation. And I don't care if you know the truths I'm going to be telling you today, that we could always know them at a deeper level and we need to experience a heart transformation before we're ever going to be able to live the command, love mercy. And so what I want to do is I just want to look at these two words, love mercy, and I want to start by emphasizing the second word. So we've got love, mercy, and I want to look at this word mercy because it brings us into the heart of God. Now allow me to do a little Bible study with you because we really, really have to uh, get down into the depths of this word mercy for what I'm about to say after that to make sense. So the best verse in the whole Bible, I believe, that explains what this word mercy means, uh, because it is a unique Hebrew word and an oft-repeated Hebrew word, and a deep Hebrew word, but the best place is in Exodus chapter 34. Now remember, in Exodus chapter 34, Moses has said to God, God, I want to see your glory. And God has said, okay, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of, of this mountain, and I'm going to pass by you, and I'm going to declare myself. And, he, and we have here the self-revelation of God. God says, this is who I am, and this particular verse is one that is repeated again and again. People are always referencing this passage in other places of the Bible. The prophets reference it, the Psalms reference it. And it's the one that appears in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, where it says this. And he passed in front of Mo Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, with those words, we have some, some really beautiful thoughts, and then we get to the end, and you felt, ouch. Did anyone just kind of go, ouch, at the end there, when I read those last words about punishing the, 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 the children for the sin of the parents? Well, let's look through it, because really it's beautiful from beginning to end. So mercy, it explains mercy. The first word in this description of God is compassionate. And this word compassionate tells us this. 
It's a word that comes from the word for womb. So imagine a child in the womb of its mother. I mean, can you imagine a, a place where a child feels more safe? And this word compassion means womb. In other words, God's mercy is womb-like. Adults, if they are panicked enough or fearful enough, will go into a fetal position. Some people sleep in a fetal position. Why? It gives us the comfort of the womb, and God's mercy is womb-like, it's mother-like, nurturing. At the same time, this passage says that it's not to be confused with leniency. It says this, verse 7, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. So God, he, he's prepared to forgive wickedness, he's prepared to forgive re rebellion and, and sin, and yet at the same time, if someone remains unrepentant, God does not just excuse the guilty. And this is why mercy is so much different from leniency. Leniency is kind of like the lazy person's version of mercy. So if I say to my child, for example, they say, I don't want to make my bed. And I say, okay, that's fine. Don't make your bed. I'll make your bed. Well, that's leniency. We're letting them off the hook, but we're really letting ourselves off the hook. So it's an easy version, but mercy is different. Mercy is costly. It costs you something. And then finally, he says these words that probably kind of caught us all off guard, unless you're familiar with the verse where he says, he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. And this is beautiful. We just have to discover the beauty because we are separated by over 3,000 years from the culture in which these words were written. But what we must understand is that the Bible never, never suggests that God holds accountable children for their parents' sin. That's not how it works. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah in chapter 34, 32 explains, he quotes this verse and he explains it. It means this, insofar as those sins are perpetuated, and we know that children unfortunately get the consequences of their parents' sin, but sometimes they actually repeat those sins. And God says, I'm going to pursue justice for those sins just for as long as they continue to those who actually are perpetuating, doing them. But here's the point. But he says this in verse 7, maintaining love to thousands. Or in another place, unto a thousand generations. This is the point. God won't excuse the guilty and the unrepentant. He will, he will do justice. Could a loving God do any less? Could you imagine if a God looked down at the world and there are these people being sold into human slavery and here are these little children being pimped out and God said, okay, that's okay. If he did not do justice, he wouldn't be a God in love. But here's the thing, rendering judgment, as the Puritan Thomas Goodwin said, is God's strange work. His natural work is to show love and compassion, but his strange work is judgment. If he must, he will, but it's not the heart of God. What God wants to do is show mercy. He's prepared to show mercy to a thousand generations, this unlimited, unbounded mercy. And all we have to do is look at the history of God and his dealing with man and we see mankind, and we see this is the God who chased down man when man sinned. This is the God who loved his people when they continually walked away from him. This is the God who came into this world to seek and save the lost and dies on the sin for people with, whose hearts are hard to him. Because he's a God whose natural bent is to show mercy even though we can be very, very cold. And that's the, the rest of the story about this wonderful word, mercy. It, it's a very unusual word in the sense that we have no English translation. Mercy's half of it. The other half is tenacity. God is tenacious in showing his love. He, is, he pursues us to show his love and what that means is, is this. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, then this is what the Bible says. If you've never personally said, Jesus, I, I receive your, 
your death on the cross for me, and I, I welcome you into my life as, as my leader and my guide. If you've never done this, this is what the Bible says. You are running away from love. That here's this God who loves you, and he, 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 he wants to enfold you, and we are these errant people on this earth who've gone astray, and God wants to enfold us, but we are saying, no, I would rather keep the final decision-making for myself. I'd rather be the boss of me, and I'm willing to say no to, to your love. But if we come to Jesus... And if we entrust our lives to Jesus, this is what the Bible says. Now, I know this passage by heart. I've said it a million times myself, but I know it in the King James Version. But I have to read it to you in the NIV Version. So here it is, Hebrews 4, 4 4 verses 14 through 16 says this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God... Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Jesus says to us when we belong to him, he says, I've got this. And I want you to know that I get you. I get you. I've been there. Literally, who could make this stuff up? We believe in a God who came down to earth, who walked in our shoes, who suffered the kinds of things we suffer and more. And he says, I want you to come to the throne of grace, and I want you to know that I've got you covered. I get it. And I want you to pour out your heart there. I was listening to a sermon by another pastor And he said he was driving down the road with his two children, eight and ten, and he had a friend in the car, and they were just talking. And he says to his friend, he says, how's it going with your children? It was a very loaded question, actually, because it wasn't going very well. This man who had grown children, when they were about the age of the two kids in the car, maybe eight, maybe ten, uh, he got involved in drugs. He fell into a life of addiction. He started selling drugs, buying drugs. He was in and out of jail. And so now his children, his adult children, really don't want anything to do with him. Now, this man came gloriously to Jesus, and he experienced the forgiveness of Jesus, but that doesn't immediately fix all of our problems, does it? And so here he's in this car, and this, uh, the, the, this pastor driver says, so how, how's it going with your kids? And then there's silence. Because this man's trying to control his emotions, and the next thing ha- that happens is he just starts sobbing. What do you do when you've, when you've messed up your life so totally and you find yourself in this place? But hasn't that been you? It's sure been me. And sometimes it's not that we've dug the hole, but we're in a hole. And Jesus says, I get you. I get you. And I, I, I've got grace for you. I've got mercy. I get your situation. You know, we, by contrast, are so quick. We see somebody, they've messed up their life, and we're so quick to say, well, if they would only have done this, you know, the way I do, and We chop them down with our judgment. We take the sword of our judgment and we just slash them through the heart. But God never does that. He comes to us and he says, I get you. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are burdened and weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For listen, listen. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your soul. I am truly gentle. You come to me, you come to me with your burdens, you come to me with your pain, and you will find, not judgment, you will find rest for your souls. Sinners flocked to Jesus. It was the self-righteous who wanted nothing to do with him, but sinners flocked to him. They were so comfortable in his presence. I uh, came across several stories this week 
that I want to share with you because each one in its own way helped me to get in touch with the, the, the gentle heart of God, the mercy, merciful heart of God. And, and I I'm, I'm, want to convey this. I, I'm praying God will help us to all take hold of this. So uh, the first story was sent to me on a video by one of our council members. And it's the story of the son of C.S. Lewis. I don't know, did you even know C.S. Lewis had some stepsons? So, so C.S. Lewis, he married late in life a woman named Joy Davidman. She went to the UK, they were married, and uh, her 10-year-old son became C.S. Lewis's stepson. And, uh, and so shortly after she was there, um, she, Joy Davidman contracted cancer. Now imagine the life of this 10-year-old. So here he is, he's moved from the United States to the United Kingdom. He's in a strange country with a strange man called C.S. Lewis, whom we call Jack. Um, he doesn't have any friends. His father, I think his father was kind of a deadbeat, as I recall, and left the family. So he knows nobody, and now his mother's being taken from him. So can you imagine, right? So this boy, he's walking home from school and he goes in a church. What do you do when you're desperate, right? He goes into this church and in this church he says he experiences something very unusual. It was like he walked out of the shadow lands of our world and into this bright reality of heaven. The presence of Jesus was filling this place. And Jesus spoke to him and he said, could you live without your mother? He said, because I can fix it if you can't. And this boy thought about it, and he thought, I, I cannot, I cannot live without my mother. And so he began this desperate pleading that God, that God would please heal his mother. And then at the end of that time, Jesus spoke again, and he said, okay, I have fixed it. Well, he left, and he went back, and uh, lo and behold, his mother went into remission. It was kind of a miracle. Well, now almost four years go by, and his mother now plunges into the cancer returns, uh, and he's feeling desperate again. He goes into the same church, and wouldn't you know it, the same experience of God's presence, the presence of Jesus, and, and he hears the same words. Can you live without your mother? I can fix it. And... And he thinks about it, and he thinks deeply about it, and then he realizes, I'm in a different place now, four years further along. And he thinks about it, he says, well, if I had to, I could. And he basically prays a prayer, you know, thy will be done. And shortly after that, his mother died. Well, that's, a, that's already amazing. The tenderness of Jesus toward that 10-year-old, it's the same tenderness he has toward you. But what's really amazing is that didn't make this person a Christian. He lived for decades a very selfish life, as by his own description. He lives for decades until one day, after being very successful, he commits adultery on his wife with a younger woman, and he realizes he's messed everything up, and he seeks out an Anglican minister, and he finally understands the gospel. He gives his life to Jesus Christ. And then he starts apologizing to everybody for the selfish way he lived. But think about, this is Jesus. So here's Jesus who comes to a 10-year-old who just has so much gentleness. This is Jesus who's so a control that he could say, I can save your mother. And yet here's the Jesus who's willing to just wait for years and decades and decades until this person's ready to give their heart willingly. I mean, we, we serve a Jesus who died on the cross like this. He's, he's not pounding his will into anybody. He waits, he displays his love, and he says, come to me, and when you're ready, when you're willing, I want it to be my love that attracts you, not, not uh, my forcing anything on you. Well, let me tell you two, two really quick stories. Tetcha Zaitama, many of us know Tetcha. She's one of our seniors in the church. I visited Tetcha this week. She had been in the hospital a couple of weeks. And she says she's in the midst of a very unusual season in which God just seems very vividly present to her. He's answering her prayers. And she put some questions to God, uh, to Jesus, and he answered them instantly, she said. Now, I'm going to, she's given me permission to share this, but I'm just going to paraphrase this, these questions and answers just a little bit to protect her, her um, 
confidentiality, but basically Tetra said this. She said, Jesus, am I going to be living long on this earth yet? And Jesus said, no, instantly. And then she said, Jesus, will you be with me every step of the way? And instantly the word came, yes. Now, does that seem strange to you in any way? Does it seem strange to you that God would be so frank? Well, here's the thing. When we know that we belong body and soul in life and in death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, when we know he's in control and he died for us, we know that when he says, you know, your time is coming or whatever, we, we know he's speaking out of perfect control and perfect love. And finally, Dinica Van Roon, you know, many of you were at the funeral, you know, or you, you know, because Pastor Mike, but I, I just, it's just so wonderful to me. So here's Dinica. She enters the hospital. She's expected to come home from the hospital. And in the last week of her life, she suddenly starts saying, God just seems so vividly present. God the Father, he's just so here. And as a matter of fact, she started saying, it's like I could just feel the angels. She couldn't resist telling everybody, I just feel the angels. It was like uh, nobody, nobody knew, the doctors didn't know, but she, she seemed to know that God was going to be calling her home, and she just could almost feel the next step. The paradise was so close. And uh, so the, the doctors called Wendy and said, Wendy, you know, your mom keeps talking about angels. We think we do, need to do another brain scan. And Wendy says, no, she'll be okay. <laughs> they didn't, you know, if you can't see it in a microscope for some people, you can't believe it, right? But what I'm trying to say is this Jesus, this high priest, this God who is so full of mercy, uh, he's there for you. All of that mercy, all of that heart is there for you right now. And sometimes there are some people who are resisting that, and then you're saying, yeah, but I could use a miracle right now. Why not me? And here's what we need to do. Because those are mysterious times. But we need to, what we need to do in those times is we need to listen to God's word and we need to look at the cross and we need to see Jesus hanging there for us, coming down from heaven to earth, hanging on that cross, and we need to believe him at his word when he says, whether I do a miracle for you right now or whether I, in my sovereignty, do not, I want you to know that my feelings for you do not change. My sympathy for you does not change. I am as much there for you as I was for that 10-year-old boy or for Dinica or for Techa. But here's the other thing we need to do, and, and remember I told you I was in this situation where I was frustrated with God, and I felt like the, the prophet Jeremiah who, said, who prayed this to God, why is my pain unending and my wounds grievous and incurable? Well, okay, I wasn't that bad off, okay. <laughs> you are to me, this is more to my point, you are to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that fails. I was saying to God, I don't get it sometimes, God, you know, I just... I don't get how you make decisions about what you're going to do and who you're going to heal and who you're not going to heal. And you know, how do I, so, I, so I said, how do I get from here to the place where I really trust this God? Well, I'll tell you, it's not by putting a happy smile on your face and saying, oh, just come to the pulpit and say these nonsensical things you don't believe. That, that's how it goes. You go to God and you say, God, I'm frustrated and I don't get it. And I, you know, you say this about yourself. And you know what? Well, I'm going to just tell you the story. You know what? So I was praying, and I get to the end of my prayers. Then I fell asleep. And then I woke up, and I felt great. All my frustration with God was gone. <laughs> Literally. Like, it was just, I think I was just, I just needed a, a, a nap. I, it was like Elijah getting the, 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 being fed by the angel or something. like that. I don't know. But the whole point is it's, it's God's got to do it. And God will do it because God is real. So, you know what? I've spent my whole sermon talking about God and his mercy. And so I got to quickly come to the point of the, of the words where they say, and I want to emphasize the other word, love mercy. And I, and I don't regret that I've spent this whole time trying to convey the heart of God because because God says, I just want you to be filled with my heart. I just want you to be like me. I want you to have an attitude toward the world like I do. I want you to love mercy. 
Not just do mercy, I want you to love mercy. I want you to delight in mercy. And, and I want you to be a haven for people. I want your heart to be a place of refuge. Life is hard. People don't need more weight put on their shoulders through our judgments. They need our compassion. They need our hearts to be a haven in the storm. We need to be encouragers. And, and we need to take concrete action you know, there's this theme in Scripture that God hears what's going on on earth. He hears the injustice. God hears the sound of Cain's blood crying out to him, or Abel's blood after Cain killed him. And God hears the cries of Sodom and Gomorrah for their, not only their immorality, but their injustice, Ezekiel says, their neglect of the poor. And God hears the cries of his people when they're being tra treated unjustly in Egypt. Do you hear, do you hear what's, what's, what people are calling out and crying out? And God says, I want your heart to be my heart. And I want you to step out and be my heart to the world. First to the church and then to the world. Because hesed, this word hesed, this, this mercy, it's first of all a covenant word. I love my people but then together in the strength of your love, reach out to the world. I'd like to invite the band to come on up to the stage. We're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper today. And I'd like to invite the elders to come up and find their place on the first row so we could serve them. And as all that's happening, I want to share a story I came across. I don't know how I found myself on the Boys Town website Boys Town is much more than this, but in the early days of the 1900s, when Father Flanagan founded it, it was a, an orphanage for boys who, you know, who, who had been left on the streets. And on their website, they explain the origin of the expression, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. Have you, you know that expression? A song that was quite famous was written about it. So he said, Father Flanagan says he was walking down the halls of, of this orphanage, Boys Town, and he saw this student with, with a younger student on his shoulder, a younger student who had polio and who could not get up the steep stairs. And he's, he's carrying him, and Father Flanagan says, is he heavy? And the boy says, he's not heavy, Father, he's my brother. And... You know, that's really what happens when we delight in mercy. You know, it would have been harder for Jesus to stay in heaven than to come and die on the cross because his heart is so full of mercy. He couldn't have stood it. It was easier for him to come and die on a cross to, to satisfy his love for you and me. And that's what he says to us. Let your heart be filled with my mercy. Start with your family, extend it to your church, the people you're going to bump into in this picnic. Love mercy. Amen. Allow, allow me to pray as we move toward the Lord's Supper. Father in heaven, we, we've been, you know, I've been giving this message and the whole time in front of me, between me and the congregation, is this beautiful table with bread and grape juice. And it says it all, Lord God, it says it all. It says, it, it describes the depth of your love for us, the depth, how willing you are willing to go for the sake of sinners such as us, people who've sinned such as us, Lord God, and we, we thank you. We thank you for your indescribable love. And we pray, Lord God, I do want to pray that this would be the day when blind eyes see that if there's anybody in this place who's resisting your love, that they would just give in today. If there's anybody here who's come to the place where they don't believe you really care for them, I, I just pray that this would be the day they surrender to your love and know that that's a lie from the devil. I pray that in this Lord's Supper, we can just become reacquainted with the tenderness of your love for us, shown to us in the cross of Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we come to the Lord's Supper, I want to...
I want to read a passage. Remember I said this, is, this verse I read to you from Exodus 34 is often quoted and expounded in other parts of Scripture. Well, Psalm 103, a familiar Lord's Supper text for the Christian Reformed Church anyway, says this, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. You hear those? Those are the words. There. He's echoing God's words to Moses. Now listen to what he says. He will not always accuse He will not harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Whether it's forgiveness we need or pity, God says, says, I have it in rich supply. Just come to my throne. Come to me and let me love on you. And that's what the Lord's Supper tells us today. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, at this time, the bread is going to be distributed. Uh, You'll just take that bread, and you'll hold on to it. And when everybody has a piece of bread, then we will participate together in the Lord's Supper. So I invite the elders to come forward.
take, eat, remember and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. In the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And at this time, we'll distribute the grape juice. Oh, mm-hmm.
take, drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. I read from Psalm 103 earlier. I'd like to read the closing words of Psalm 103, where David says, Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Oh, sorry, this is the beginning of Psalm 103, excuse me. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. I just want to read that again. Forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases. You've never been healed from a disease that God didn't heal you from, who redeems your life from the pit, and crowns you with love and compassion. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Uh, one day we're going to see you face to face, Jesus, and we will be able to rejoice in everything you accomplished for us, but until then you tell us to walk by faith. But you give us things like the Lord's Supper to strengthen our faith so that you could touch us by your Spirit and remind us of how close you are every step of the way. Lord, in this place today where hearts are just too weak to trust, we pray that you would restore that hope. To each of us, Lord, work in our hearts and draw us to yourself and just show us your glory. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen.